everybody. Thank you for joining us today. A quick poll. Who uses Slack? Yep. We're in good company. <laughs> These are our people. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me, Carl. Yeah. Uh, very excited to be uh, back here on the stage. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about pro productivity. It's a great topic. You've built probably the world's most famous productivity tool. And yeah. that's a pretty you know, amazing I, position. I think, I, I think productivity is a really interesting topic because when I think about, you know, when, uh, when, when you ask me, you know, like, how are you productive? I, I think I'm, I'm not productive. I look at my email inbox and it's a disaster. <laughs> I never reply to people. I feel like I'm never on top of things and there's always so much to do. And I think there was this whole kind of whatever it was, 15 years ago, this cult of like productivity, getting things done, and it's all about making to-do lists and filling every possible moment of your time and checking off a lot of tasks. Um, and I think that is, that's an interesting cult to subscribe to, and I think it's mostly about productivity theater and appearing to do a lot of things. Um, and I think productivity broadly, whether it's about individual productivity, whether it's about organizational productivity, is not about the actions you perform, but about the, you know, the, the how, how, where you're moving. And, you know, it's the difference between, you know, speed and velocity, if you like, of mm. it doesn't really matter how fast you're going if you're going in the wrong direction or if the things that you're working on aren't important. And so I think productivity is as much about prioritization and mm. alignment as it is about execution, uh, you know, and approach, if you like. Mm. So I guess we're battling this cult of busyness versus impact or yeah. you know, change or having a way to make things move in a direction that's um, you know, beneficial. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. I think you know, when, when I look at my personal productivity mm. over, over my career, I, it is very easy when, you, when you're a leader, um, you know, you're a founder, you're an executive, some kind of organizational leader, it's very easy to equate being busy with being productive. Mm. And being busy is, you know, when you're, when you're a leader in an organization that's growing, you are very interrupt driven. There's always things happening. People want your attention. There is always the, the most recent thing to work on. And it is very easy to fill all of your time with that and feel, get to the end of the day and feel like, I did a lot of things. Um, I got a lot of things done. And for also to have spent no time on the things that matter, mm. the things that are you know, strategically important. Um, and I think this is, a, this is a trap that I certainly fell into a lot is my, you know, as a like interrupt driven, as a leader, you tend to be very calendar driven. And the more meetings I have in my calendar, the more productive I must be. That's definitely not true. Um, the, maybe we'll get into like meetings and productivity and broadly <laughs> and making meetings effective. But the, I think it is incredibly important to, to constantly step back and look at what am I spending my time on? What do I need to be spending my time on to move the organization or myself forward? And that's, you know, like, long, am I spending the right balance of time on long-term strategic versus short-term tactical work? Um, am I, you know, spending the right amount of time with the right people? And... And also, am I spending the right amount of time on the things I want to be doing? Now, sometimes those are pretty different, right? Like, the, you can easily fall into the trap of only doing the tasks that you like and not the tasks that you don't like. And that is somewhat important. I think it's important to not just do things you hate because that will, you know, grind you down and be a terrible way to work. But, but it is important to not only spend time doing the things you enjoy. Yeah, the unfortunately, you like the most. it's a necessary evil to do some of those less desirable tasks like paying my taxes and doing my tax returns, right? It, it is important <laughs> to eventually pay your taxes, yeah. uh, you know, as, as paying as that might be. That's my task for the weekend, actually. <laughs> what an exciting weekend ahead, and you can, you know, perhaps be very productive. Well, that, absolutely. But you know, as a leader, someone in a leadership role, how do you, I guess, nurture that sense of productivity or meaningful productivity amongst staff who may be, um, you know, in, a, in a, a growing role? They might be early in their career, and they really have to. Um, there are, I guess, hard lessons and skills you need to develop to be productive in the workplace. I, I, 
Yeah, for sure. And I think the most important skill to develop over time as a leader for, for productivity, mm. um, other than like prioritizing your own time, is getting good at goal setting. Mm. Um, getting good at um, s- setting goals is I- incredibly important at an organization level, at a team level, at a personal level, and is just really difficult. Um, if you are, however good you are, or you think you are at, at goal setting, if you set yourself a goal and you achieve it, did you do a really good job or were you bad at setting the goal? Mm. And should you have set your sights higher? If you set yourself a goal and you don't achieve it, were you bad at doing the task or were you bad at setting the goal? And I think any kind of uh, you know, like a goal setting activity is an iterative thing that you have to do over time, you improve at over time. And I think there's a, lots of different schools of thought on this, but I generally think that a set of goals, it is good to, to aim to achieve to achieve about two thirds of them at a time, mm. um, uh, you know, and uh, not like you set two thirds easy goals and one third hard goals, but you know, you set goals that you strive for, knowing that you won't achieve all of them. So mm. I think, you know, otherwise it's it's hard to kind of calibrate what you should be reaching for. I think the other part of that is it is very. It's not. It doesn't work for everybody, but I think it's very useful as a leader to be like design, divinely dissatisfied with everything all the time. It is important that like. You know, you need to celebrate wins. You know, you need to acknowledge when people do really good work when do the you business mean, is mean going. Mean that amongst yourself or amongst oh, I, the team? I mean broadly with Everybody? the team. Yeah. I think you know, if you are, it is important to celebrate when things are going well, but also like recognize that everything can be improved. However well, like you have the best, most performant company in the world, you're achieving the most amazing outcomes. You could be doing better. Nobody is ever operating at their peak efficiency. No person, no organization. There is always room for improvement. Mm. And I mean, that's why you look around, look around this conference, and a lot of the startups here, or all of the startups here, are doing some, something that has been done before in some worse way better. Like this is all, this white space is all opportunity for, you know, for our, our companies to exist, um, is looking at something that already happens and saying, we could do better than that. But I think it's, it's very easy. Um, I, I, find, I find myself falling into this trap a lot with software. I install, like I try a new app, I install something on my phone, I look at it, and in the first five seconds, I'm like, this is a piece of shit. Like, I can't believe they shipped this. I pressed the button, and it didn't immediately work. All the fonts are off. I don't, like, I would have done this better. It is very hard to consistently look at your own work in the same lens through which you look at other people's work. And I think it is important to constantly look at what you're doing, like your company, your product, you, you and how you spend your time, and you bring that same critical eye to it because I think you know, that's how you strive for improvement. Now, I think you have to be careful because not everybody is motivated by shame. Um, and like, some people just find that a real downer. But I think you, know, you need to, if you want to like, be, be really productive, be really successful, you have to strive for that. You have to always be more ambitious than you are. It's like, we achieved this amazing goal. OK, but what can we do that's, what can we do that's bigger? And I think you should you know, look constantly reflect and look at your own work in that way. Yeah, but I mean, ultimately, we're at a time where arguably we are the most distracted we've ever been with, you know, Ah. constant iterations and we have social media and we have alerts and, you know, things happening. (laughs) And it's funny, I actually have a visceral reaction to the Slack noise. So the knock brush? Having worked in workplaces where you're expected to be online all the time, yet you have to also find that time to do um, deep focus work, like we do as journalists, to actually write an article, you need to put your head down and re- read that report, or write, or transcribe, or what have you. How do you balance that? In that you've you're, you've been part of this movement that's created something that, whilst it's brought people together, it's also been a major contributor to destruction. Uh, absolutely, and you know we're, we're certainly not like blameless in that, but I think it is more of a general trend that yeah. we're moving towards, which is you know if you look at knowledge work today versus a decade or 20 years ago, work is more complex and more collaborative, Mm. generally involves more people and more moving parts, and there's more information. Now, you know, if the if the choice is purely between, you know, working in email, siloed communication and, you know, a fire hose of information, it's not it's not a great choice. But it's the, you know, the the vision that we had for Slack and how we started out using it is much more that there is all this information that's available to you. You won't consume all of it, mm. um, but it's available to you, and you can, you know, some amount of it you'll consume and will be like interrupt driven, highly important, but a lot of it is more a stream of communication that you can dip into. Now, 
because that's not how we use email typically you know you read everything that came into your inbox hopefully one day um, but, but you saw it much more as a to-do list like I have to yeah. take these things off by you know archiving them or deleting them or whatever uh, replying to them um, I think you know when when we first released Slack we saw an, most of our customers were using it like email and they saw it as like oh, really? you have to do an inbox zero mm. uh, like but now I'm suddenly subscribed to a hundred times as much communication as I was before. And that's not sustainable. You can't just spend all of your time, you know, uh, responding to Slack messages. And, and as you said, you also, you know, depending on your role, you need to do deep focused work. And I think the, it is a, as you know, any new tool, Slack like is not particularly new now, but you know, it's a, you know, as the, the kind of communication paradigm changed in the workplace, organizations needed to adapt how they use it. And if you mm. use a tool like Slack in the same way that you used email, you're not going to be terribly successful. Mm. And so I think it's the using it in the right way. And for me, using it in the right way was often turning off notifications if I needed to do some deep work. Totally. You know, and I, I think mm. that the world had already changed in that direction um, you know, fairly significantly just because of the rise of the smartphone. Mm. You know, if I go back um, 20 years to before we had iPhones and I used to like do a, a one hour train ride to work every day I had free offline time in which I could oh, focus so and true, think right? about things yeah. and now I get four or five seconds of offline yeah. time uh, you know between uh, between picking up my phone and putting it down and so like we have a lot more distractions uh, but we also have a lot more access to information than we did before. Mm. Uh, and the work has become more complex. So I think it is, you know, it's an environmental change rather than just a tool change. But I think it requires a different kind of discipline from people mm. using it to understand how you want to use those tools. But the other piece there is an expectation one of That's you, have to have you have to have organizational expectations around how important is it to respond to something in real time? How important is it to, to read this and get back? And I think the setting you know setting boundaries around that as a team as an organization is really important mm. and how you model that as well as a as an exec yeah uh, i mean leader. we've all got situations where people send us emails on the weekend and they'll often say at the bottom you do not have to reply on the weekend but the reality is you're thinking about it right <laughs> so it's actually sort of leached its way into your brain and it's distracting you or it's you know taking up some space that maybe it wouldn't otherwise if they'd send it to you on a monday or a friday right yeah, I, I think that's true, and it, mm. you know, it's different for different people in different yeah, roles, obviously. Because totally. when you're a like a, a startup founder, you're thinking about work all the all time, time. <laughs> anyway. You know, you, yeah. you dream about it too. You wake up and first thing in the morning is you wake up because it's a, a notification or a call because there's an mm. emergency. Um, but a whole organization doesn't have to work that way, and it's also not particularly sustainable. Mm. You know, you can't do that for decade after decade. Mm. So, I mean, do you have any thoughts given, you know, you've got a lot of experience around how startups can really nurture that work-life balance. So we know that we've seen, for example, in some countries, um, the right to switch off has become more of a phenomenon, but are there things that teams can implement in a tangible way that really drives that amongst their, um, their members? So they aren't doing those 2 a.m., you know, Slack messaging or emails or what have you? Yes. Um, well, I think that that becomes more and more challenging generally as yeah. organizations become more global. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, if you're here in Finland and working with somebody on the West Coast, mm. it's like well, there's always somebody who's asleep, and that exactly. and that's tough. So I think especially multi geographic teams have to be way more intentional about this. Mm. Um, but I think the biggest thing you can do as a leader is lead by example. Mm. So you know, something that I that we added to Slack long ago that I regularly utilize is instead of sending, me I might be working in the middle of the night, but instead of sending messages in the middle of the night, scheduled send them for the next morning, mm. um, so that people aren't interrupted outside of work hours. It's like keep, you know, be disciplined about whether you're working, you're not interrupting other people outside of those core hours, and setting expectations reasonably. Like if you don't. If you're not responding to non-emergency things in the middle of the night, that doesn't make you a you know a, a mm. bad or less productive person. I think the you know it, it just leads back into that productivity theatre piece. It's mm. not because you respond to messages really promptly that you're productive. Uh, that that just means you respond to messages really promptly and not celebrating that. Yeah, and have you seen a shift amongst your users that have kind of navigated the difference between working remotely or working perhaps from home or com compared to working in an office? I think definitely we saw, 
you know, at the at the very beginning of the pandemic, you know, when um, when there were lockdowns in various countries and a lot of people were, you know, switched to suddenly working from home, what we saw is a really elevated. People were using Slack for the same number of hours per day, uh, yeah. which is just their workday length, but they were sending a lot more messages. And I think that's because you know that was you know uh, replacing in-person communication. You know, you could send someone a message or you could talk to them at their desk, and now it's all sending them a message. But what was kind of uh, perhaps most interesting is post, you know, as people started to return to the office post pandemic, we didn't see a drop in the number of messages. So, you know, it was there is just more communication now than there was in the past. And I think that expectation of, of you know, like more, more things being recorded and more things being sent digitally, you know, partially that's because with teams being more distributed or hybrid, that it's good to have that record so that everybody is on the same page. I think the, you know, the it is easiest for everybody to work together in a single location. It is mm. second easiest for everybody to be remote in completely different places. Yeah. And it is hardest to be hybrid because you end up with like a, you know, a two tier system where people who are in person, you know, just get, get more information, feel more connected and people who are remote feel like second class citizens. And so I think, you know, very disciplined teams uh, are better at recording all communication digitally so that it's accessible to people who aren't there. Um, and, uh, and I think we've, we, that definitely has been borne out in the data post, post-pandemic mm. and after the you know, partial return to office. And I guess something that stands out for me with a tool like Slack is that you've got a large repository of knowledge, workplace knowledge within the data, right? That a company has hopefully you know, kept to themselves, <laughs> so to speak. Um, is there a way to, um, it, to, I guess, give that the advantage that you might have got from perhaps, say, onboarding or documentation that you know, we used to traditionally have as a matter of course in, in a workplace? Yeah, and, and I mean, that was a, the originally one of, the, one of the kind of sell points yeah. for Slack was, you know, you, you join, this is all about email, because it was, you know, going back yeah, more totally. than a decade now, was that if you join a new organization with email, you start on day one with an empty inbox and zero context of what went before, and you mm. spend some time, you know, you, you talk to your coworkers, you learn kind of by osmosis how the company works, what the status of things are, what's been worked on, what's been tried mm. in the past and what's failed. Yeah, you know, totally. that's stuff you learn and it just takes time. You know, that's what an onboarding is. Mm. You join an organization that's been using Slack or a tool like it, you know, you can look, you can just look at what happened yesterday and look at what happened last week and look at what happened last month. Now, in a small organization, you can just ingest all of that and understand. In a large organization, you know, that might be millions of messages per day. Yeah. It's a like ridiculous fire hose of information. There've been some, you know, Slack ourselves uh, built a bunch of kind of AI oriented features around mm. this for synthesizing that information. But there have been other startups as well built on top of the platform that help surface that information. Because in theory, you know, if you, you go back to companies of the past, the idea that there was like company archivists and historians and librarians yes, curating true, right? information. Now, we have more information than ever, right. but it's much less curated because mm. there's so much of it. So the idea that, you know, I think there's a lot of optimism that, uh, that one of the powers of large language models is mm. that, you know, being able to synthesize very large data sets that a human could do if they dedicated their life to, you know, reading mm. Slack messages. Um, yeah. And so I think that's a really useful superpower that we've seen from LLM driven products is the ability to really tap into that growing archive that every organization mm. who uses Slack or something like it has. And I guess when we talk about remote teams, we kind of contrast that with what's traditionally been the, uh, what's the term, I guess, a water cooler chat, where some of that legacy knowledge that get passed down informally, it could be cultural, often it's just about, I don't know, getting to know personalities that you don't, might not yes. pick up those nuances in text. Like, yeah. is there a way to balance that in these, by using these kind of tools? Um, maybe. Yeah. I, I think that... Um, Not easy. I think that is, you know, one of the things that still, as, as much as there have been lots of interesting startups in that space of trying to replace kind of in-person meeting, we haven't even really talked about meetings, but like, the, meetings, you know, yeah. seeing people face to face, I still think that that is that's like a thing that is still much better done face to face, you know, that even the when if you look pre pandemic at the most successful distributed organizations, firstly, there weren't that many of them. And secondly, they weren't very big. But what they all had in common was they all got together face to face on a fairly regular cadence. And so, you know, you do your relationship building, um, you know, like whether you think about it in those terms, it's really what's happening, that relationship totally. building yeah. and forming and, and kind of 
uh, kind of broad planning, and then you can go, you know, disperse yourself to the wind for uh, for the actual execution part. Mm. But I think that as you know, as much as I spend my whole life mediated by technology, it hasn't really solved that in person, you know, uh, you know, relationship building and bonding. Yeah, things. yeah, exactly. I mean, I see my team once a year, maybe twice yeah. a year. You know, and, as and a that whole. and that time is. Probably you wouldn't think of it as your most productive time. Not so much. <laughs> um, but in some ways, it is. You know, it is the thing that fuels the ability to be productive and be aligned with the organization the rest of the time. You know, I think the, you know, as I said at the beginning, productivity is really about execution towards the thing that you're supposed to be doing, towards mm. the direction that you're supposed to go, because otherwise it's just work. Um, and. I think the thing that sets apart organizations that are the most successful from organizations that aren't in this era is the ability of that organization to align and realign all of its all of its employees and its people. You know, the the company, the leader that the leaders that are the most successful aren't ones that always make correct decisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you always made correct decisions, that'd be amazing. But they are people who make decisions and then change direction as a result of the outcomes. Because you know you can like you can die in both directions of you know you never make a decision or you just make decisions and then and then stick with them. I think the right thing is make a decision but be able to respond. And that that organizational agility, the ability to repoint your organization, is the thing that makes organizations productive. And it gets harder and harder the more people you have. You know, like agreeing uh, two people agreeing to something is easy enough. Getting Absolutely. 10 people to agree on where to go to dinner, almost intractable. <laughs> and if you have a thousand person organization, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it is network effects. It is much, much harder. And I think the, that organizational alignment, getting people pointed in the same direction so that when they do go fast, you're heading all, you mm. know, all in the right direction it's, is the key. Yeah, exactly. It's a really good point because I know when we talk about productivity, we can also tie that into things like, obviously, those personal relationships you develop, the culture of a workplace where you work harder sometimes because you like the people you work with, right? Yeah. And, it's and, a huge I mean, part of work. The, especially the kind of, uh, you know, millennial stereotype, if you like, that people want to work um, for organizations mm. and in positions that they feel aligned to, that Absolutely. they feel like uh, has a, a cause or a goal that mm. they can identify with. And they fit, right? And, and that they fit in, mm. yeah. And that people uh, are most productive when they understand why, the, uh, why and how the work that they're doing contributes to the organization's goals. Mm. I think it is, you know, it's not, we're not people building widgets on the production line. We, and we want to understand why is the work that I'm doing important? Mm. What is the, how does it contribute? And I think goal setting for an organization is a lot about laying out why the work that's happening is important and finding work that isn't important and stopping doing that. Yeah. Mm. And so, okay, we've got a couple of minutes, so just a quick question, I guess. Um, what are some tips or some hacks that maybe some of the founders can use who are sitting here today and they're maybe getting slacked while they're sitting here listening to us talk about Slack, <laughs> kind of meta there? Yeah. You know? I, I, I have found personally that my biggest productivity hack, if you like, is every, every so often, maybe every couple of months, look at your calendar for the upcoming week. Um, uh, or oh, sorry, before looking at it, think about what percentage of your time would you like to spend on which kind of activities? Nice. What percentage of time would you yeah. like to spend on um, developing your top performers, mm. on recruiting, on long-term strategy, on short-term kind of tactics? Fundraising. On, on fundraising, mm. you know, on partnerships, mm. um, on managing out low performers, wh whatever it is, right? Mm. What percentage of your time do you want to be spending on each of those things? Then look at your calendar and see how poorly it aligns to that, mm. and then stop doing some of the things that you're doing. Um, you know, keep doing some of the things you like if they don't align to that, because you need to also enjoy yourself. Uh, but you know, make sure that how you're spending your time aligns with how you think you should be spending your time. It's incredibly easy to drift from that and just mm. be interrupt-driven. You know, be busy because so much is happening. Um, but I think that it's the Andy Grove Intel thing of like, try and imagine yourself. If you were new coming into your role today mm -hmm. with all the information that you have, what would you do? Like, what would you think is the most important thing to do? And then why aren't you doing that? Because it's the most important thing you could be doing. It's too easy to fall into the trap of you've been doing the same thing for a while and you get into the groove so of you what you're doing. Yeah, you get comfortable. Mm -hmm. And like any process, anything you do, it's worth 
constantly looking at reinventing it, throwing, away and try, throwing it away and trying something new. Not absolutely everything you do all the time, that would be maddening, but constant iteration. Look at what you're doing, how you're spending your time, and how you could be uh, trying something new. Keep experimenting, you know, that, like that product iteration constant cycle. Do that with how you work, uh, because there's always so much room for improvement. How you work right now isn't possibly the best possible way to work, so keep trying, keep iterating, um, and you know, you'll gradually move towards more productivity. Fantastic, and thank you so much for being with us today. It's lush. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.